My castaway this week is one of Britain's best-loved animators, Oliver Postgate. As the creator of Ivor the Engine, Nog in the Nog and the Clangers, his films and voice have a special place at the heart of countless childhoods. Indeed, his TV series Bagpuss was, only a few years ago, nominated the best BBC children's programme of all time. An achievement made all the more exceptional because only 13 episodes were ever produced and they were made in a cow shed at a total cost of £700. Yet the picture of Bagpuss conjures of a cosy sepia-tinted childhood is significantly at odds with its creator's experience. Brought up largely by a series of neglectful housemaids and plonked in a progressive boarding school he hated, he says, I came to regard myself as a nuisance. As a result, I suffer from a basic assumption that I am wrong. So this insecurity, this, this feeling of, of not quite being worthy or belonging, uh, that began very early. Oh, yes, it was almost like a sort of witch's gift. I was led to believe right from the very root that somehow anything I thought of was inherently wrong just because I thought of it. So I then had to think of something even funnier and even cleverer than I would naturally think of in order to be there at all. And it's quite absurd. I've only come to realise what it meant many, many years later. That's an incredible phrase, this witch's gift. You describe it as, what, a sort of almost little curse that was thrown upon you. Yes, it's a witch's gift. It's something that is inserted into your psyche at a very early age, but not intentionally. The knack that you perfected as an animator was creating these perfect microcosms, these, these tiny worlds where the details were the all-important things. I, was, was the detail significant to you? As a child watching it, that was what seemed important to me. Yes. Uh, really, we didn't have time to think about that. We didn't realise, Peter Fermin, who's my colleague, we were feeding the television machine. We just worked, and we, we thought up stories, and we didn't really think about them being anything except fun. And they were produced out of this tumble-down shed in Kent, not from an animation studio. I mean, what was day-to-day -day working life like? I had my animation table and all these pieces of cardboard, which were the limbs of the people involved in it, and I was pushing them along with a pin and pressing the button on the camera in the hope of getting about 120 seconds of film out in a day. I now more recently have discovered that the average animation studio gets two seconds a day out and considers it's done well. You grew up then, Oliver Postgate, in London, in a prominent political family. What kind of childhood did you have? They weren't prominent, exactly, but they were very political, that's right. My grandfather was George Lansbury, who was leader of the Labour Party in 1935 and a pacifist and a great socialist, and my mother was his secretary, so... She used to take us to the House of Commons occasionally, and we heard him speak, which was marvellous. I couldn't understand a word they were talking about, but it was a lovely sound. My father was editor of Tribune, which was a left-wing um, weekly paper at the time, and we were deep in the movement, in a sense. But, of course, all that meant was that my parents were, were rather absent most of the time. Your parents were busy, but they weren't busy with you. Ray, my father, was a rather distant figure, but he was very friendly, and Daisy, my mother, was a very important part of my life, but a lot of the time she wasn't there, and John and I were regarded as a general nuisance, I think, as indeed we were in a tiny little box of a house in Hendon. Did you like confidence as a little boy? I appeared to be an arrant show-off all the time, trying to draw attention to myself and everything else, but this was an upside-down effect. I just simply wanted somebody to admit that I existed, and so I really had either complete confidence based on the fact that there was, of a complete absence of confidence. I do hope I'm making sense. That does make complete sense, I think, yes. I'm relieved to hear it. It took me a long time to find out that it made sense. In 1939, then, war broke out, you were evacuated to Dartington Hall School. That's right. A progressive school. A progressive school, yes. Where you were entirely left to your own devices. Uh, pretty well. I couldn't find anything to join in with. I'd, I'd been in an ordinary school in which uh, there was a hierarchy of some sort. I was a member of a house, and somebody cared what you did. The essential thing about Dartington was that it was theory-led, and you were required, expected to do what you fancied. So if, some, if I went to somebody and say, what shall I do now? They would say, well, what do you want to do? And I would say, 
I don't want to do anything except what I ought to be doing. And they would say, no, no, you must do always do what you want to do. And I didn't want to do anything at that time. I wanted to join in. It's a very good school for goats, but it's no good for sheep, you see, and I'm a sheep. It was one of the unhappiest periods of my life. What sort of legacy do you think that education had? Oh, uh, very, very powerful on me. Having been deprived of self-discipline completely, I still, in my 80s, have a fight with myself to make myself do something I don't fancy at any given moment, which is ridiculous. It makes me really angry with myself. But you see, here you are having this terrific uh, life of of involving children, engaging children, because of the ability of your imagination and your technical skills. And you could say the reason that you've developed those very original skills is because you were given this mental flexibility, if you like, because of your education. I don't think I was given it. I had it all along. Well, uh, it was fostered, I mean, by that yeah, education. Yeah, in a sense, to some degree it was. But that was original. That was there already. It could have been fostered by another school, and I might have become something useful instead of what I am. <laughs> I'm rather glad I didn't. <laughs> So then in 1943, I mean, you were 18 then, and you were called upon to do your bit for king and country. What was your reaction? <sighs> very difficult. I was very firmly convinced that Hitler was a phenomenon of the Versailles Treaty, that the way which Germany had been treated at the end of the First War was the cause of the discontent that gave rise to Hitler, and that if we had another one, then the wheel would turn again and there would be another... 50 million people killed 25 years later and it seemed to me at the time that to join in was wrong. I mean, I think I was wrong in doing it because in practice the wheel did not turn again. Your father, Raymond Postgate, he had also been a conscientious objector. That's right, that's right, and he put me in touch with the Quakers and they told me how to go through the process of becoming a conscientious objector, which I found the army didn't really know about. <laughs> so what happened when you actually went along to not sign up? I, was, I got my call-up papers and I said, I'm not coming, but I will present myself for arrest at the Cumbermere Barracks in Windsor at 11 a.m. on a Thursday. And I can remember arriving there and they hadn't told the man in the guard house about it. And he said, well, what, you come to sign up then? I said, no, I've, I've come not to sign up, actually. He said, look, 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 look wouldn't you have done better doing that somewhere else? <laughs> I said, no, he said, well, all right then. So this rather nice, um, well-brought-up, eaten, educated officer came in and said, oh, well, what's the drill, old man? Can you tell me? I mean, what do we do with you? I said, well, I think you have to you have to put me into custody then. He said, oh, I don't want to do that to a chap. I said, no, I don't think you've got any alternative, really. He said, well, I, I, we won't lock the door. I said, will that be all right? I then had to sort of lead them through the process and it was marvellously English, actually, and I was so relieved by the courtesy with which I was treated. To be clear, you spent two months in prison. Oh, yes, yes, the, the whole thing was totally absurd. I, I enjoyed it tremendously. You talk about the courtesy with which yes. the establishment treated you, both when you decided to be a conscientious objector That's right. and after you came out. And you have said since that... That opportunity has left you feeling like, I think your phrase is, a guest on the planet. Eventually. My brother said, in passing, there's no reason why we should feed you, is there? This is when they were bringing food in from abroad, and I said, there's none. And Because uh, you'd have refused to because fight? Because I'd refused to fight. In general terms, I have this reservation that I was not entitled to be righteous. The world didn't belong to me. And uh, yes, as you say, I am, in a sense, a guest. Your CV is intriguing. I mean, you spent, uh, after the war was over, about a decade doing some, uh, well, I was going to say odd jobs, and actually some of them were very odd jobs indeed. I mean, you, <laughs> you, you managed a button plating factory. That's and, right. I even made the equipment to do it. You, so you invented the device? Yes, yes. I invented things. I was actually possessed by this demon of invention. What about some of the more bizarre things that you invented? A rotary grass cutter? Oh, yes, these were fortuitous. I can remember my poor mother with the washing machine. There weren't any washing machines about, and I made her one out of a milk churn, but because 
I couldn't make the sort of gland to keep the water in, I had to rotate the entire frame backwards and forwards. It washed beautifully, but it had this strange habit of wandering, so that she would switch it on and nip out of the scullery, and she never knew where it was going to get to, and sometimes she would come back and hear it knocking against the door as it was trying to get out. And then one day it, it managed to turn itself over and it died in a heap of bubbles and all the lights in the house went off. It sounds like something that would be in a fantastical animation, actually. You could have employed well, that at a later Well, the reality, age. I assure you, was... was, was I, I did. I made her one of the first food mixers. They all worked. You clearly have a very creative brain. You have described yourself in the past as a, a verb, not a noun. What do you yes. mean? What do you I'm mean a by thing that? for doing things. I was brought up to think of myself as inferior. I didn't exist unless I was doing something, unless I could show that I had achieved something. So I was f forced into neurotic achievement almost. And Prue used to say to me, for goodness sake, get yourself a project you're not fit to live with. I felt I was like a mincing machine or a sausage machine and that if there was no sausage going through, it minced itself. You mentioned Prue there. You had spent your life up until you met her. Sort of drifting? Would that oh, be yes, fair? absolutely, yes. because I was trying to find ways of earning my living, but the only end product was myself. Um, I met Prue, and she had already got three children, and suddenly there was somebody who accepted me as I was and uh, was happy with me. So as well as finding love, you find purpose because the three yes, children were Yes, yes, I, I wasn't uh, just feeding my own ego or anything like this. I had really got to earn enough money to keep four other people, you know. So I immediately went and worked for the television as a stage manager. And what was your first venture into animation then? How did you come from being a oh, stage manager? Well, quite simply, I was attached to the children's department at ITV and I looked at what they were producing and thought well I could do better than that so I went away and wrote a story called Alexander the Mouse the mouse born to be king and at the same time the company had adopted a completely mad form of magnetic animation and so I found Peter Fermin who was um, an artist he was a bit dubious about making these cardboard mice to be moved about with magnets, especially because if you approach them from underneath the table, uh, if you've got the magnet the wrong way around, they would leap in the air and turn upside down, which occasionally happened on the programme, so I had to reach in a hand into the picture and turn it over. And thank goodness nothing was ever recorded because it went out on the air. So Alexander the Mice was your first collaboration with Peter Fermin. That's right. What do you think the key to your relationship with Peter was? He had a large family to keep and I had a large family to keep and we had work to do. So we got on with it and our life was spent in dispute. It was as if he was my brother in a sense because we argued fiercely all the time. People said those two can't ever work together again. But the moment the subject we were arguing about was finished with, nothing remained, we were still friends. Was the decision to use your voice for all of these uh, soundtracks and explaining the stories, was that again purely practical? We couldn't afford anything else. At Ten pounds a minute for the finished film, we had to use what we could use. I had been an actor, you see, for a while, so I was used to performing, as you might call it, but only later, when we started getting properly paid for the work, we were able to afford actors. <laughs> but even then I kept on doing the narration and everything else, because it seemed to work. <laughs>